Hello and welcome to Otten Math. In this edition of Otten Math, we're going to review how to operate with radicals and then also how to solve quadratic equations. So we're talking about this because we're going to get into the Pythagorean theorem. We need to understand how to work with radicals and quadratic equations before we apply the Pythagorean theorem and use it in its many different applications. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, just with some basics. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, square roots and uh, what we mean by taking a square root and what's squaring a number. <clears throat> so the inverse operation of squaring a number is taking its square root. Uh, as an example, I give you 3 squared is equal to 9. So if I uh, perform the inverse operation of squaring this value of 3 to get to 9, that inverse operation is going to be taking the square root of 9, and the square root of 9 is going to be equal to 3. Now every positive number has two square roots, one negative and one positive. So <clears throat> if I have uh, 9 as a value, I know that 3 squared will equal to 9, and negative 3 squared is also going to be equal to 9. A negative value squared is always going to be a positive number. So if you take a negative number to an even root, you're going to end up with a positive value. All right, number three, the positive square root of a number is called the principal square root. So these are just some terms. So if you hear principal square root, square root, or if you're asked to find the principal square root in a test, now you know that the principal square root of a value is the positive value, the positive square root of that given number. Number four, the square root or uh, every even root of a negative number, so a square root or if I say the fourth root of a value um, of a negative number is always going to be an imaginary number. So if I take the square root of negative nine or the fourth root of negative nine, I'm going to end up with what's called an imaginary number. The imaginary number is equal to the square root of negative one. And in this case, if I take the square root of negative nine, I end up with 3 times i, or 3 times the square root of negative 1. A perfect square is a product whose factors are the same integers. So I give you perfect squares on the left hand side. I've got 1, uh, 4, 9, 16, 25, and 36. And all of those values are going to be perfect squares. So the factors are going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, etc. So I know that <clears throat> um, if I have a perfect square that's under a radical, then I can simplify that into the integer um, in question that, uh, when multiplied by itself, gives me that perfect square value. All right. So let's talk about um, simplifying radicals. All right, when you evaluate a radical, uh, the f we want to talk about uh, we want to talk about evaluating radicals and refining or solving or expressing the radicals in simplest form. So when you're completing any operation using radical, you always want to leave it in the simplest form. In simplest form. Uh, when you evaluate radicals has two different components to it. The first is that you always want to leave the radical in uh, a form where there are no perfect nth roots. So in this case we're only dealing, dealing with square roots. So we want to take out any perfect squares underneath the radical. And we can see that 16 in this case is going to be a perfect square. I have 4 times 4. So when I evaluate a radical I'd want to I wouldn't want to leave it as 6 square root of 16. I want to simplify it so there are no perfect roots underneath the radical. So this value here, 16, is called the radicand. And this uh, squiggly sign over the 16 is called the radical sign. So we want to make sure that the radicand, 16, is not a perfect square, uh, or has no perfect square uh, factors um, in the radicand. Okay, so in this case, 16 is a perfect square. Uh, we simplify it by uh, removing all of the perfect square roots. Uh, in this case, we 
remove the 4, the 16, we end up with square root of 16 is equal to 4. And that's going to be in simplest form. Now, if I have the square root of 7, there are no perfect square roots in 7. So I leave it as the square root of 7. Now, what happens if I have the square root of 12? I do have a perfect square value. And we'll go through this in just a second when we talk about the product property of radicals. Square root of 12 is equal to the square root of 4 times the square root of 3. And 4 is a perfect square, so the simplest form of the square root of 12 is going to be 2 root 3. So I've removed any perfect square factors from the radicand, and I've separated those out into a factor or into two radicands and two radicals. Square root of 4 times the square root of 3. And by removing that perfect square factor, now I've uh, produced or I've expressed that radical as uh, 2 root 3, which is now in simplest form. Okay, the second component about simplifying radicals is that uh, when you express a radical and you provide a solution, uh, you want to make sure that there are no radicals in the denominator. So all radicals in the denominator need to be what's called rationalized. And that means you need to multiply the value of the entire term, so in this case it would be 3 over root 5, times <coughs> the uh, value of the radical in the denominator. Now, it can get a little bit more complicated, but we're just going to deal with a simple, simple process here. If I have 3 over root 5, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply 3 over root 5 times root 5 over root 5. Now, root 5 over root 5 is is just equal to 1. So all I'm doing is I'm rearranging the values in the numerator and denominator to create a the same equation but uh, with the radical or the rad radical sign removed in the denominator. So when I multiply 3 over root 5 times root 5 over root 5 I do what's called hair brushing. Uh, my hair stays the same right but I'm just changing the way that it looks. So in this case, 3 over root 5 times root 5 over root 5 gives me 3 root 5 over 5. And again, that is the same value uh, as the initial term, 3 over root 5, except that the denominator has been rationalized. And the final expression here, I get my pen to work, 3 root 5 over 5 is in simplest uh, form. Okay, so again, two components. One is radicals in simplest form when it has no perfect nth roots in this case we're just dealing with square roots so no perfect square roots as factors um, as <clears throat> or as part of the radicand and then secondly its denominator has been rationalized all right so product properties uh, properties of radicals when we evaluate and I I gave you when I was talking about uh, simplifying radicals we talked about the product property of radicals and that Product property of radicals means that the, the square root or the nth root of a times the nth root of b is going to be equal to the nth root of a times b, or vice versa. The nth root of a times b is going to be the equal to the nth root of a times the nth root of b. And so I give you an example here. The square root of 3, and by the way, if there's no, in, this is called the index, this value here, n is the index. If there's no index that's identified as part of the radical sign, then we are to assume that that index is going to be 2 and that it's a square root. So in this case I have the square root of 3 times the square root of 7 and that's going to be equal to the square root of 21. So the product property of radi uh, radicals just says that the nth root of some value times the nth root of some value is equal to the product nth root of the product of those two values. The quotient property of radicals says something similar except now that we're just dividing the two values. So the nth root of a divided by the nth root of b is equal to the nth root of a over b. And so I give you an example. The square root of 81 over the square root of 9 is the same as the square root of 81 over 9, which is the square root of 9, which is equal to 3. Okay, so just remember, keep those in your back pocket when we talk about uh, expressing or simplifying radicals, product property of radicals, and the quotient property of radicals. All right, uh, on to the last component of our discussion, 
we're going to talk about factoring quadratic equations, and we're uh, going to factor quadratic equations only when the a value, this is the coefficient that's in front of the first term with x squared, is going to be equal to 1. So in this case, I give you an example. That's a quadratic x squared plus 4x plus 3. And I give you the form for quadratic equation, or quadratic expression in this case, ax squared plus bx plus c. We'll just make this equal to 0 to make it an equation. And the way to factor uh, the quadratic, so ultimately you want to simplify the quadratic into an expression um, x plus something or other times x plus or minus something or other. And we want to figure out <coughs> those factors to figure out what the roots of the solution are. So, and let me just write here, 0. So what we want to do is we want to uh, create a diamond. This is the diamond on the left-hand side. And we're going to place the values of c, so in this case it would be 3, and then a times b, which would be 1 times 4, or 4. And you want to find the factors of c that add to a times b. So we're looking for the factors of now 3 that add to 4. And once we get that, we're going to place those values ax squared, um, which would just be x squared here, the factors of c that we determined from our diamond process, the c value. And then we're going to use that box process to factor uh, the quadratic equation or expression that we're given uh, in this particular problem. Okay, so let's go through the entire process again. So just remembering what we did in the prior slide. Uh, we want a times b to be in the top part of the diamond, and that's going to be 4. And we're going to place c. So remember, this is the c value. It's uh, c as a letter, but also c is the constant. It's constant because it has no variables attached to it. And so we're looking for the factors of 3 that add to 4. The factors of 3 that add to 4 are going to be 3 and 1. So again, in the upper left-hand corner, we're going to put the x squared, ax squared value. In the bottom right-hand corner, we're going to put the c value. And then we're going to put the factors of um, a times b that add to c. In this case, it's going to be 3x and also just x. Then we place these little hash marks on the outside. And what we want to do is we want to identify the common factors in the rows and columns. So let's take the first column. The common factor in the first column is going to be x. And the common factor in the second column is going to be 1. The common factor in the first row is going to be x again. And the common factor in the second row is going to be 1. I'm sorry, it's going to be 3. So here we factored our quadratic. It's going to be x plus 1 times x plus 3. 